Great, thanks. We're delighted to have Yu Xiang here. Yu Xiang is a faculty member of the Computer Science Department at University of California, Santa Barbara. Prior to that, he was with Amazon AI in Palo Alto, and even before that, he was in the machine learning department at Carnegie Mellon. Over the years, he's worked on a lot of problems in statistical machine learning, such as differential privacy, optimization, and bandits and reinforcement learning. And we're really excited to have him here today to talk about his recent work on near optimal provable uniform convergence in off-policy evaluation. Over to you. Yeah, thank you, Kira, and, and thanks to the organizers for, for having me. And it's a, it's a um, great sequences of uh, seminar series that brings the people together. So I um, personally have been enjoying the workshop, um, um, uh, enjoying the seminar series. Um, so, so today I'm going to uh, talk about our recent work. Um, it's uh, based on a joint work with my student Ming Ying and uh, uh, my prior intern and, and now research scientist at Salesforce, uh, Yubai. Um, okay, uh, I highlighted the, the uniform here because um, that, that's a key topic of this talk, um, even though uh, I also go um, into a little bit of uh, details about the, the point-wise of policy evaluation, so I'll define what this means um, as, as they show up in the, in the talk. All right, um, so, well, uh, let's get it started. Um, so the talk is going to be about RL, so, so in a typical RL setting, I'm just uh, uh, um, taking this um, block diagram of an agent interacting with the world, um, receiving rewards uh, and, and the new states after taking every single action. Um, well, um, and the agent is supposed to learn how the world works, um, which is um, like a learning problem um, to learn the dynamics and also um, try to maximize the long-term reward at the same time. So that's a control problem and reinforcement learning aims at achieving both things at the same time through an interactive interface um, uh, through the feedback. Okay, um, so, so recently reinforcement learning has seen uh, significant advances um, and uh, gaining significant popularities so given the uh, extreme success of uh, su such methods in playing games and in all sorts of other environments that uh, people care, uh, care, care more about nowadays when ML becomes more and more popular. Um, so, so just to figure that that uh, last year at NeurIPS, I, I think uh, um, there was a like people who um, there was some some um, like articles uh, counting the number of papers on RL or at least touching the topic of RL. So that's more than two hundred and co consists of a large proportion of uh, 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 of of the total number of papers that, that uh, appeared at NeurIPS. So some of these applications, like involving bandits of RL, are not only playing games, but the learning um, um, how to interact with uh, the unknown world by an uh, actual robot, um, playing um, playing games, and uh, having this bandits problem of trying to serve uh, advertisement in ways that are uh, maximizing your profit, and so on and so forth. Okay. Um, with all these applications, so people start to think about whether uh, reinforcement learning is a method that can be used in the real life for all um, sort of other problems, uh, such as um, um, RL for, for robotics, uh, for self-driving car, for learning how to, say, treat uh, um, um, a disease, um, learning how to use it for sustainable energy, for, I, I guess, um, maximizing user interactions, and, and and, and, and so on. So there are many applications that you can think of in RL because it's such a general framework uh, that allows you to, to not only learn like in the supervised learning sense from some fixed distribution, but also somehow control the distribution in ways that are favorable to you. Um, and, and, and with a good, good care taken, um, like RL can be a like, really powerful technique that, that helps us to, to make the world a better place with more and more intelligent control. On the other hand, like applying RL in, in, in the real world is, is really challenging because, um, uh, well, um, in, in practice, we don't really have access to a simulator and, and we can't um, interact forever with, with environments without uh, costing us anything. Um, like computation is cheap, but, but when, when, when you have to collect the data, when you have to design the experiments to collect data, so that, that's even um, um, like more, more expensive. So every sample starts to matter and, and, and every data point is costly, so we wanted to, to um, design algorithms that are as efficient as possible. And there are legal and safety issues and so on. And, and often there are large, complex, and continuous state space and action space with, with 
complex and unknown dynamics. Sometimes there are um, long planning horizons um, that you have to deal with, and and there are situations where where you are limited not by the the um, total number of steps you take, but by like the number of times you change your your policies and so on. So. Um, so there, the, therefore, with all these challenges, um, there are many um, like related theory and applied work in reinforcement learning nowadays that try to address these issues. Right, um, like like I, I'm pointing out like one of these issues um, that that when people say an uh, applied machine learning scientist starts to look into reinforcement learning and got intrigued, I wanted to build it for like say a, a particular application that, that this engineer is interested in. And, and the starting point of the project is, is often uh, well um, some historical data. Right? So, so you are given the huge data set, uh, but when the, when, the, when the scientists look at the existing papers that, that, that seems to have worked, a lot of them start from scratch, start from an, uh, a simulator, and then, then you start by collecting data all by the algorithm itself. And, and the, the, the scientists start to wonder, like, should I just throw away my already collected data, or like, should I somehow use it um, somehow? Like, like maybe it is just difficult to to push the project through. Um, like unless you have you can show some evidence that, that based on the existing data you are already able to learn something that's meaningful. Um, so so that brings us to the topic today, which is offline reinforcement learning, also known as the batch reinforcement learning, uh, when the setting is that you have. Um, like a bunch of trajectories data that's collected by running um, like a so called logging policy, which we call mu. Okay, so let me try to write, which we call mu. Um, and then like this data is fixed. Um, and, and then uh, the task um, like fixed and assumed to be sampled uh, with some um, like policy that might be known or unknown. Um, and the task uh, is twofold. So the first task is so-called off policy evaluation or OPE uh, with a focus of being say evaluating a target policy. Let's say that the um, um, like like, like you are the engineer and you came up with the, the, the best algorithm ever to, to, uh, to, for the recommendation system and, 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 and you wanted to somehow evaluate this new algorithm without deploying it to the, to the real world. So A-B testing is expensive. So can you actually see how your, your new policy works with just historical collected data? Okay, so, so in OPE, there is a fixed target policy pi and the goal of um, like the off, off uh, offline policy evaluation is to, um, to to evaluate the different policy comparing to the policies that you have had deployed before. Okay, and the related task is the so-called offline learning problem, uh, where where you wanted to come up with an um, like optimization algorithm or some kind of learner that work with the offline trajectories that's already collected, and then come up with um, a new policy um, pi star that's um, as optimal as possible that that, that maximizes the the, uh, the the cumulative reward. Uh, um, like suppose you run that policy in the future as much as possible. Okay. These two tasks are related in that, like, if you can do off policy evaluation, uh, then you have an objective function that you can optimize. Um, but, but like, like you can't really do the, the kind of off policy evaluation, um, the offline policy evaluations that, that are typically being studied with a fixed pi. But instead, you you can you, you can connect these two by uh, uh, the main topic of today, the uniform convergence. Okay, uh, um, I'll talk more about it. Um, so, um, so, 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 last um, slides about uh, the motivations. So, so there, there's some like example applications of offline RL. So you can use it for, um, well, um, things that are uh, sensitive and you can't really explore. You can't afford to run your experiments and so on. And and often you, there are a lot of data that are available to you, such as the recommendation system and medical treatments and so on. Um, and well, um, there are cases, say, for new material discovery and for learning self-driving car. Um, well, uh, it's it's easy to to parallelize experiments. So Tesla can update their firmware uh, where to to collect new data. So every week or every month, but but they have uh, uh, millions of vehicles running all all uh, all over the space, uh, collecting new data for them. And and what's limiting them is really the number of iterations. So for every iteration. Um, so it's, it's in some sense an offline uh, le learning problem. 
And and the connection to online RL is is that um, like you can you can treat the offline RL as a building block of online RL. At, at least you can use it and chain a sequence of offline RL together to to um, to to create um, like a low adaptive online RL, RL algorithm that hopefully um, behaving optimally. Okay, so 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 here are some of the potential applications in both the real application and the theoretical algorithmic applications of the offline RL setting. So I hope this convinces you that this is a useful and highly practical relevant setting to, to, to study. Okay, so the outline of uh, today's talk um, are, are going to be these four items. So I'll start by like, since I'm looking at the uh, a, a very theoretical audience, um, and, and I see a lot of familiar faces, and uh, happy to see you all. So I'm going to start by defining the notations and problem setup, um, so 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 we can we can all like talk on 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 the level with sufficient details to to keep you guys intrigued, um, and and then uh, I'll describe our contributions in the nutshell, um, comparing to the related literature. Um, I'll then like go into details of uh, of uh, the the few of our uniform convergence theorems for um, like the offline um, evaluation problem, um, and and before uh, I, I get into some key um, like notable like think technical components, uh, at least in, in in our opinions, they are um, like mostly new and and how we are working with them are are somewhat interesting. So so and then I'll end the talk with a few open problems. Okay, so that's the plan. Um, um, like, um, like during the talk, so, so this is qu quite informal. So, so if you have any questions, feel free to just post it on the YouTube channel, post it on the Google Meet uh, chat. When I see them, I may just respond them directly. Um, 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 like, or like, we, you, you can you can also wait until the end. Until slide seven. Um, well. Uh, yeah, there is a question about how to get the pi star that's equivalent to some unknown mu. Uh, well, uh, no. So, so getting pi star that's equivalent to some unknown mu is, uh, in some sense, the policy imitation problem rather than the policy learning problem. We're trying to actually, uh, in, in, in offline learning, we're trying to, to get like the near optimal policy uh, with one shot. OK, so, so it, that, it will be clear once I define the problem setup and notations. All right. So, so yeah, uh, I'll have like a couple of slides about notations. Uh, please bear with me. Like, if you are familiar with uh, um, like these notations, it should be pretty straightforward to you. Um, so, so um, if I'm going too slowly or too quickly, please just let me know. Um, so, so specifically, we're consider a very simple setup uh, with the episodic, um, non-stationary, or time-varying Markov decision processes that's in the tabular case. Okay, so this is in some sense the most baseline setting um, and, and the simplest possible setting to, to, to talk about uh, all the interesting parameters of a reinforcement learning problem. Uh, we'll assume the standard notations with number of state being S, A, and H, and uh, like lowercase a denote the, um, yeah, sorry, Lo uh, denote the number of offline trajectories that you collect. So the number of steps is n times H. Um, yeah, actually, like later, I might use this notation n differently, but I, I hope I will not be using this n. Um, if, if I do, I, I'll make sure that I remind you the connection to, to this lowercase n. Um, like, like this is not the same n as that capital N that's appeared in the archive version of the paper, um, just in case you have read it. Um, so so um, I'm, we're also defining the time varying transition kernel uh, PT. So this is a function from those, uh, your current state and the action you take and the states that you're transitioning to and assign that with a probability, um, um, denoting the conditional probability of uh, PT as prime S and A, um, since these are time dependent. Uh, just, so this just a quick. Uh, yes. Question slash comment. So this time that you're talking about is is a time within a, an episode, right? Like it's an yeah, index. That, that's right. That's right. Yeah, it's time right. within the episode, right? So the yeah. transition kernels is actually different for every time uh, time point within the single episode. So so they are in total um, um, like eight steps within each episode, um, and and the data that you have um, have n, n n trajectories or n episodes that that has already been uh, been collected. Okay. So RT is a time-varying expected reward as a function of state and action. So it is actually 
at the form of our t, say the first sample um, given as t and a t. Okay. Um, and we're using the, the notation pi to denote the policy, um, but it's actually a, a collection of a tuple of h uh, different policies um, like that, that's active at different time step of this um, like time varying MDP and we call the login policy mu. Okay, um, um, well, um, um, similarly, uh, you can define the, the, the cumulative uh, value function um, um, under pi. So this is that suppose you start at time t with state s um, and, and then keep rolling out with policy pi and expect a cumulative rewards that you end up getting. Okay. Um, and also there's a state action value function, uh, Q function also indexed by pi. When we replace this pi with star, we are referring to the optimal uh, value function or Q function. Importantly, um, there's also a lower case V to the pi um, that we define here. So this is the critical concept. Um, so, so this is like a single value measure of how good a policy is. Right, so this is saying that starting from the first step and you are keep running this policy pi until the, the end of the horizon. And this is a cumulative, expected cumulative rewards that you get. So this is objective, one number objective measure of how good a policy is. So what's the initial state here? Uh, the initial state is drawn from some, some um, like uh, distribution. It's a fixed distribution. Yeah, it's a fixed distribution. Yeah, it, it doesn't really matter that, that much, but the, yeah, let's assume that this is fixed distribution for that um, expression to make sense. Uh, well, uh, uh, there, there are a couple more notations. So, so when I talk about the trajectory, it's a sequence of uh, triplets in a form of state action rewards. State action reward, um, well, um, like quadruplets actually. Um, yeah, if you are um, like repeating the as S2, um, uh, well, uh, and the corresponding distribution would be the state one drawn from some distribution. You take the action according to pi, and then you transition to the next state while observing the uh, the R. So when we have an index i on top of each one of these notation, we're referring to the i's trajectory. Um, and and like just bear with me. There are a couple more more notations. So so we define this d. Um, like uh, sub t and, and sub pi to be the marginal state action distribution um, when you are running running pi. So these are the marginal distribution of state and actions induced by uh, running a particular policy pi. Okay, so um, so so notice that it could either um, be um, the like uh, a marginal distribution of state only, or like suppose you. Uh, um, like um, multiplies that with a policy, then, then you get the joint distribution of state action at time t induced by policy pi. Um, and, and in addition, so this transition matrix, if you, uh, at time t, if you also index it by pi, then, then you can make it like a square matrix kind of thing, uh, where you are describing the, the, the transitions and the evolution of this state action um, state, state action distribution over time when you are rolling out with policy pi. So think about it as, um, yeah, think about it as, um, as this, the PT pi as a matrix. So this is ISA by SA matrix. And then um, you have this vector that is uh, DT pi. And after that, you're getting DT plus one pi as a, as a vector of SA. All right, um, that's a lot of notations. Um, and I guess that that's a kind of necessary evil that we all faces, uh, uh, we, we all face when working on reinforcement learning. So, so there's a question on slide um, page 10. Um, why does v pi not depending on the initial state? So that was Taba's question as well. So the initial state is not fixed, but rather drawn from a, a particular distribution. So we're taking averages over, over that distribution. Um, so exploration. So exploration is often the hardest part of reinforcement learning, but unfortunately we're not uh, be dealing with exploration in, in, in offline reinforcement learning, mostly because we don't actually have any control over the login policy. Instead, um, we have to make some sort of uh, assumption about it so we can, we can talk about 
um, like uh, getting to the optimal policy uh, with offline learning. So there are variants of, of these um, assumptions. So sometimes you can go with the more agnostic approach and only find like um, the, the, the optimal policy that, that's in some sense measurable uh, with your login policy, but that's not the, the kind of um, stance I'm going to be taking for today's talk. So in today's talk, I'm going to assume away the problem of exploration by saying that the login policy actually satisfy um, some kind of um, like near uniform uh, style of assumptions. So, so we define this quantity dm uh, to denote um, like when you are running this login policy. So this is the smallest uh, uh, probability of uh, seeing um, um, like S, A, and T uh, for, for, for all state action pair at time uh, at, at each time t um, um, with um, some kind of non-zero probability. It's like you, sh you, sh you should think about this quantity as something that's proportional to one over uh, s a. Okay, so every episode you are getting um, uh, h steps, um, and and with uh, if this is really uniform exploration, then you are getting this dm to be proportional to one over s a. Okay, so so again, this is assumed to simplify the discussion, and and often, um, like actually, sometimes they appear only in, in low order terms, and it becomes uh, le less of a trouble to assume. But 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 not 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 always. So so I'm I'm gonna first start by making two high level observations, um, and and the first observation is that um, um, the OP is in, in fact just a, a statistical estimation problem. Um, it's non-trivial because we are we are um, estimating a single number, but there are a whole bunch of nuisance variables that that are governing the distribution of the model. So so taking care of those nuisance variables carefully uh, is is critical for getting the 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 right estimation bound for this single number, which is v um, v pi. So sorry, uh, Shibra had a question. Uh, maybe it's going to be important to uh, later. Oh yeah. Yeah. The so, question so was, um, how much do we know about the logging policy? Um, not at not at all. Um, you, you don't have to know about the logging policy for for the most part of the, the talk. Um, for for the for the mo mo most of the algorithms we, we propose, all, all you need to have access to. Yeah, actually, like knowing the the logging policy and making use of it in your estimator can actually hurt you. Can actually lead to higher variance and larger estimation error. Yeah, that that's a very interesting observation. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Um, and, and so the OPE, formally uh, speaking, is to come up with um, like an estimator, we had pi such that we are uh, getting some kind of epsilon um, parameterized by all the model parameters. So it can be with high probability and can be also in expectation um, by minimizing the MSE as all the st statisticians like. Okay. Um, Another observation is offline learning is essentially a statistical learning problem, but it's a somewhat non-trivial one because it has a very structured hypothesis space, um, which we call the policy class. And you also have very structured observations in terms of trajectories. So, so, so borrowing the lessons from statistical learning theory, we, we know that like uh, the empirical risk minimization is uh, almost sufficient and necessary to, to efficiently learn any learnable problem. Um, so, so maybe we wanted to replicate the same thing for reinforcement learning. Can we do uh, the empirical risk minimization? Then the first bump that we run into is that we need to define some of the OPE estimator uh, in order to do uh, empirical risk minimization. So, so in the context of RL, this is what ERM means. Yeah, just to find arc max for all the policy with some policy class. Um, so, so the task, um, like, um, suppose we just combine that that with 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 um, like OPE, um, so maybe like um, if you're able to show that the OPE is valid for your um, like optimal policy pi star and and also valid for for this policy pi hat, then you can maybe bound the suboptimality by by two times the, the OPE bound. But but why is why is it not the case? Yeah, that, that's that's like. Um, Really, really, because the pi hat is data dependent, you are using the same data to optimize for pi pi hat, and also using the same data to evaluate uh, pi hat. Then, then issues arise when you, when you try to come up with this, this sort of bound. But you can patch that 
by using uniform convergence. So in, in the previous notation, we are just simply adding the supremum um, over all policies. Suppose we can simultaneously evaluate all, all policies with high probability or, or at least bound the uh, expectation of the soup of the square error, then we are able to, to get a policy optimization bound. So, so that's what we call the formulae uh, the uniform convergence. Okay, so in the standard statistical learning, so that blows up the, um, the, the error by a factor of square root of D, where D come with a, a bunch of different names, it, like sometimes it's VC dimension. Um, when, when you have a discrete policy class, D is often just a, the log of the cardinality. Uh, it could also be metric entropy um, and, and implied by some calculations related to Rademacher complexity. Um, so Vapnik has had a lot of pioneering work of this in, in machine learning literature, but uh, um, it dates back to much older literature in empirical process theories. So the natural question that we ask here is what is a natural complexity measure for the policy class in reinforcement learning? And, and we hope to address this at least for um, the, the, the tabular set. All right, yeah, um, like uh, in a nutshell, uh, our main contribution um, of this work uh, is um, like it, it's two, two, two things. The first, uh, we characterize the, the error of OPE for any fixed given policy and is described by this complicated expression. So I assure you that this expression matches the, um, the primal raw lower bound um, like up to an additional um, like low order term. So this is saying that that we have the per instance um, like optimal um, point wise uh, offline policy valuation bound for every fixed pi, uh, uh, every fixed pi, uh, pi and mu pair and, and then every fixed uh, Markov decision processes. If we simplify this a little bit um, and we can, we can get that to parameterize by all our assumptions made and directly by the uh, time horizon. So we get this quantity, uh, square root of h square over number of trajectories and over this dm. Um, can I ask a high yes. level question? This is about the, the mean square error as an objective. I, I think that it's just very convenient for the Kramer row. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's probably not really what you care most about, right? Like either you care about like a high probability lower yeah, bound. Yeah, you, you can get the same bond. Uh, you, you can get the same same, same high probability bond with the same same error. Um, with, okay. with, with, so, you know, square root of log, log one over delta. And and the reasoning uh, underlying that that shows that you can get the same bond is is like how does it work? Um, so so that, I talk about that. that yeah, there's a Martingale decomposition that, that we're going to be, be talking about that, that allows okay. you to apply Friedman's inequality in specific ways. Okay. And then yeah. the lower bond would uh, have the same form. Do we know that? Um, you mean a high probability lower bound? Like we, we, don't, yeah. we don't have a, a lower bound that's stated with um, like log one over delta, but we have any constant probability lower bound that's also the same form. Um, yeah, so, so actually, like for um, Kramer roll over bound, it's like the right measure for the minimax theory as well because it characterizes the local, uh, in some sense, the local minimax, minim minimax error um, in um, at every local neighborhood uh, separately. So, so, so there's a Lacom the theory that that completely characterizes the the point wise uh, optimality in the minimax local minimax sense, which is a longer discussion. So yeah, right. which is a much longer discussion. Um, um, and, and the second thing, uh, which is the actual topic of uniform OPE, is that uh, suppose we just put this estimator um, that gives you this um, and then takes arcmax by cal calculating the ERM. The ERM obeys um, the, uh, the optimal rate uh, for, for offline learning, uh, which is square root of h cube over, over NDM. Okay, so that's in the nutshell uh, of what, uh, what, what, what we have. Um, so now, now let me compare this to the related literature. Um, so, so, so uh, prior results on off offline evaluation are are like like these 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 are by no means a full list, but I'm just uh, um, presenting a couple of uh, uh, notable ones. Um, yeah, it, yeah. Please forgive me if I I, I did not like cover your your results because there there are so many it's impossible for me to cover everything. Um, so, so back in the 19, the simulation lemma uh, can be used to, to do this kind of off, off policy evaluation and you get 
some bond, but with suboptimal dependency in, uh, in H, uh, H and S. Okay. Um, and, and the important sampling based approach, uh, for instance, these, these uh, appeared in the Sutton and Bartle book. Um, like either you use trajectory wise or stepwise important sampling that blows up the, um, the, the, the dependence on H to, to exponential dependence. And that motivated the whole line of work in, in breaking the her curse of horizon um, uh, recently. Um, so one of them is marginal, uh, marginalized important sampling. Um, and and uh, the formal theoretical analysis of that, like what was done like by, by us in Europe's 19, and then we end up getting H cube over NDM. So this is still some optimal in terms of H, but it's unclear whether it's improvable like for that specific setting because that, that setting is not entirely tabular because it allows uh, like infinite actions and so on. So finally, that was tightened uh, in the tabular case specifically by just ignoring the knowledge of knowing the, the login distribution, by, uh, but, but rather instead like uh, replacing that with empirical estimate um, of the, the, the uh, empirical estimate of the, the, the login um, the, the login probabilities for different actions. So the similar uh, observations has been made in one of um, Taba's older paper in the in the multi-arm bandit setting. Yeah. So so we can I ask yes a clarification question. So I probably just missed this, uh, but when you are replacing n times d m. Mm -hmm. Uh, by n over s a or something like that, then you kind of just arguing that like that's the best case for dm. Like um, so, in oh, all yeah, of yeah, 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 I see. eventually, I see. yeah, I, I see. So when I when I replace dm by s a is to so like to get rid of one parameter. So the typical um, regime for dm is one over one over, one over s a, but it but dm is much first. smaller. It can be much smaller. We actually like, have. Uh, you would be also. really lucky to have that. That's that's the best that we can. Yes. Hope yes. For. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Exactly. All right. And, okay. And we yeah, can actually to know that. Like that. That's, that's the reasoning. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, well. Um, so 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 I'm not gonna gonna cover this slides in details, but but let me briefly explain what this tabular MS is. So it's basically a plugging estimate, and it's actually equivalent to the model based estimate. So, so you decompose the value to be the, the plug-in, and then you estimate this quantity, and you estimate this quantity on the side, and then you basically um, plug it in and then, then get a simulated solution. And there are two representations. Either you go by a model-based representation that looks like this, or you go with an uh, important sampling-based representation, which looks like this, but they are, they are all equivalent. So, so in some sense, we're using the same estimator as, as that, uh, that that's covered by the simulation lemma. Um, so, so in that sense, like our result uh, is essentially a strengthened version of the simulation lemma that allows you to to, to evaluate, evaluate policies better. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so um, the prior results on the offline learning literature. Um, so, so the first thing that I like to point out is that the simulation lemma is actually a uniform convergence bound. So, even though they they did not say it, but they simultaneously apply to to, to all um, like target policy pi. Okay, um, and uh, well, um, uh, more 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 recently, so they are like increasing interest in, in batch RIL offline learning. So there are methods that get rid of this additional dependency in S. So in, in particular in Xi'an John, they came up with specific algorithm for the offline RIL on the very similar uh, setting, but it's translated into our notation. It looks like this with, uh, a slightly worse uh, dependence on the horizon. So you've got H force over uh, over N NDM. Yeah, whenever I write like translated into, that means I'm translating the result uh, from the infinite horizon setting uh, and replacing this one over one minus gamma uh, with, with H. And, and um, there's also a related literature uh, in reinforcement learning with generative models. Um, so in, in these cases, the sample kind of complexity um, are, are um, understood more and more carefully. So, so C4 et al. and, and concurrently uh, Martin Benwright, they, they had a proposed specific algorithm based on various reduction um, that, that allows you to, to uh, use the generative model um, data, um, simulation data to get the, the, the optimal, get to get the optimal rate. Okay, but I, I wanted to highlight that these apply to specific algorithms. They are not going by uh, the stronger uniform convergence kind of argument to get them. So their guarantees apply only to their specific algorithm. 
Um, so, so that was changed later in the generative model setting by this very nice work by, by Argawa, Kakade, and Yan, um, appeared at Code 20, um, that are able to simultaneously evaluate a bunch of near optimal, uh, near empirically optimal policies. And, and then for all those, um, like data dependent choices of pi hat, you can show that um, those are, are, are near optimal. So, so this epsilon OPT measures the, hump, the extent to which that you're close to um, the empirically optimal policy based on your, um, your estimated MDP. Um, so, so for instance, if you run value iterations and policy iterations forever, like this will be zero. And, and, and then like you end up getting something um, that, that's on the right order. Sorry, this distinction between specific algorithms and like non-specific result is is a bit unclear. Mm -hmm. um, so can you elaborate on that? Uh, I assume that like we are trying to estimate, you know, the values of uh, a bunch of policies. So that kind of suggests that okay, you could have algorithm independent lower bounds, and then for some algorithm, you prove a matching upper bound, and then you're happy. So what was the problem? What's the deal with the specific algorithms? Oh, uh, oh yeah. I know that yeah. uniform convergence doesn't care about you know like algorithms or whatnot, but like is that what you mean? Or, or yeah, yeah, that, that's 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 what I mean. So so we're we're dealing with uniform convergence, which is one specific way of showing that a continuum of algorithms can actually achieve um, the, the the optimal rate. Uh, whereas like there's an independent task of uh, constructing right. specific algorithm with upper bound that matches the lower yeah. bound. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. I hope that's that's clear. If not, I can. Uh, I mean, so whenever you're talking about uniform convergence, there is an underlying S demand, uh, and then yeah. you're uniform yes. in the parameter of that, and then the uniform convergence. The uniform convergence is the, the optimization problem usually, and you use it as. Uh, as a hammer to solve the optimization yes. problem. Yes. Uh, but but this algorithm here, sit for the dial and win right. This is for policy evaluation, no? No, no. They are they are for. Uh, that's for the policy optimization. Okay. They are for policy, policy, optimization. Are for policy optimization. Yes. So so these bounds are suboptimality bounds for the policy optimization. Okay. Okay. So it's like together somehow the uniform convergence and the optimization. Yeah, I yes, see. Yes, we no we're no uh, uniform convergence approach. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just, yeah, I just missed that. Uh, I hope that, that it's clear for everyone. Okay. Uh, all right. So uh, um, so, so um, like in, in a nutshell, our, our result is the first that achieves optimal rates in the in the offline setting, um, and uh, and and um, and also like the first, I guess, without the generative model setting, it's also the first that achieves optimal rates uh, by a, a uniform convergence argument. Um, and and on, on the side, we also have a formal lower bound for the uh, uniform convergence problem, where the construction is pretty standard. So I, I won't bore you with it. Um, yeah, so that's basically um, the, um, the, the the summary of our contributions. Okay, so now um, yeah, just to convince you that that this order is right. Um, so so here are some simulation um, for a point wise evaluation of the optimal policy, and you can you can see that so this line is proportional to to square root of h square. Whereas if you find the empirically optimal policy through either evaluation, value iteration or policy iteration, then you can get that this line is proportional to the square root of h cube, right? So this convinces you that, that this is really the right scaling um, to so, wait, so the value iteration, policy iteration graphs are uh, like on the top of each other because that was just the computational approach to solve. Yeah, yeah, because, we, yeah because we run that for, for yeah. indefinitely many longer. Okay, time. all right, gotcha. All right. Um, well, so 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 let me talk talk a little bit about why is this problem like an uh, interesting and a non-trivial problem. So so first of all, even the point-wise convergence is non-trivial for this problem. Um, and and the secondly, like suppose you consider the discrete policy class, which we know contains the optimal policy. So the cardinality of that is actually like a to the power of h s. So when you take log, you end up getting h s log a, and additional dependence on h start to show up. 
right? So if you directly combine the pointwise convergence with a union bond, then you do not expect to, to get the optimal rate um, because we actually ex uh, expect the order of H blow up in terms of this, um, then, um, like some kind of pseudo dimension uh, rather than um, proportional to HS. In fact, we, we tried a bunch of things and most standard approaches such as random macro complexity and all the entropy based approaches would end up leading to suboptimal dependency in SNH. So it's really the kind of intrinsic structure of the Markov decision processes and this uh, sequential learning setting that allows us to, to save a factor of H uh, on this problem. So, so um, and, and another thing is uh, getting optimal dependence on H is often quite tricky. So, so just take this complicated expression from pointwise convergence that we talked about earlier. Um, so, so we are actually adding like a bunch of uh, variances that are um, potentially as large as H, H squared. Because these are cumulative value functions um, from H to H plus one to H. So each one of these can be H squared and we're adding H of them together. And, and, and what you can actually see is that, that this is always on the, 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 the total is always on the, on, on the H square. So when, when, like the first time I saw this, like it was mind, blo uh, mind boggling because this is really coming from the, the, the structure of the Markov decision processes that says that you can potentially have H square in some of the steps, but in other steps, like it's in some sense crowding things out. When that happens, all the other steps will have a conditional variance that's are much smaller. Okay, so there's a, a like easy proof um, from one of our earlier paper. So, so now let me tell you a little bit about our um, like main theorems uh, in, in um, uniform convergence. So we consider like three uh, policy classes and all of them work for the purpose of offline learning. So, so there, there's a family of all policies, including deterministic and stochastic policies. Um, there, there are also um, um, like a family of empirically near optimal policy. Um, um, so, which is covered in this green, uh, uh, this yellow bubble um, that's in some sense data dependent. Um, and, and the optimal policy is here. It can either be inside this or not inside this, um, um, but it's, it's definitely inside the set of deterministic policy. Okay, so so and, and I'm gonna state like three uniform convergence theorems for each one of these, um, and and depending on how much more time I have, I, I might be able to talk about the proofs to 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 one of them, and and looks like I won't really have too much time for that, but but I will save that for the subsequent discussions uh, with uh, uh, off record. Okay, so the first uniform convergence uh, theorem is the following. So for all policies, then we can we can bond the terms using some kind of a, um, like red marker complexities uh, style argument and, and then get it bond with, with high probability with these two terms. Um, so in the first term, we get the log one over delta uh, and we get H, H to the fourth and without additional dependence on SNA. Uh, on the second term, unfortunately, we, we need to blow up both H and S by, by a factor. So, so recall that the optimal, recall that the optimal bound uh, that we expect is H, uh, uh, H uh, cube um, over NDM. Okay, um, but if we set uh, delta to be somewhat small, at least this is a reasonable assumption when you have a very small number of states. Um, so in this case, you can get, get rid of the dependence in uh, S over here because you, you, you don't really have this one over delta in the log. But it's still suboptimal in H. Um, and the second theorem applies to all deterministic policies. So this is straightforward. You simply take a union bound with a high probability version of the pointwise um, OPE. But in this case, as we, we, we talked about earlier, the, the total number of policies in the deterministic policy family uh, is, uh, uh, is A to the power of HS. So, so you, you blow up the dependence on H, uh, on S by, by, by a little bit. Okay. Um, well, um, the, the third theorem arguably that, that's the most interesting um, is to uh, consider the, the the, the region uh, that's defined as follows, define all policies such that um, um, you are uh, like empirical uh, evaluated value function. So this is like the V, the value function corresponding to your empirical estimated MDP 
Uh, so provided that like the L infinity norm of this is upper bounded by some parameter epsilon opt, then you can get the optimal dependency in everything. Okay, and, and how small does epsilon op uh, opt needs to be? It needs to be smaller than um, square root of h over s. So, so something that's independent to n. So, so uh, um, and 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 also like as you keep optimizing using policy iteration or value iteration or any other optimization methods to solve the offline problem, um, then then you're always able to get to uh, epsilon opt to be arbitrarily small within polynomial time. Okay, uh, and the assumption on n is also mild; it's proportional to to h, h square. Okay, so yes, there are many things going on here. So uh -huh. one is that you switch to the action wave functions and infinity norm. Is that wait, wait. What's going on? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so this is just something slightly stronger. So, so, so this this implies that you can get a we hat. Um, yeah, because pi minus we pi. This implies that soup over all pi within this sure. term. Uh, uh, same thing. Yeah. And then, so basically, you take this random neighborhood of the empirically optimal policy, and yes. within that random yes. neighborhood, you can um, show this uniform bound. Uh, and I'm guessing that you are hoping to use this in an optimization result in some way. Um, could you clarify the question a little bit? I, I don't think I'm following the, the question. It, it's like, why do we care about controlling the error in this neighborhood? Oh, oh, oh let, let me explain it again. So, so there are all sort of plenty of algorithms that you can use with an like estimated MDP model. So you can try to play with it, you can use all kinds of heuristic algorithm to do the search for the optimal policy. And sometimes you're able to get to the optimal solutions, the other times you can't, right? So, yeah, so yeah, okay, I, I, got, I got you, right? Like, so you, you can't, you think that pi hat star would be impossible to compute, and maybe you're gonna get close to it in this yes. sense, yes. and then you care about whether you're gonna be precise enough uh, so Shipra is asking a question related to this that are we going to ever know this because there is this condition in Ethereum that you know like the epsilon off should be yeah. small enough and should be big enough then like how do we know for example DM that that might be you know like impossible to know because we don't know the MDP, right. but the DM is like, how big is that? So do right. we have enough samples? D D DM, um, so my answer is the following. Um, um, DM is not an input to the algorithm. So you don't need to yeah. know it. You run the algorithm. And these are the, the theoretical guarantee for the algorithm and for your estimator of the policy, um, which holds under these additional assumptions that it needs to be sufficient. So, I guess. I guess this would be okay if you could also say that like it's impossible to do any better than this or something like that. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We actually have a lower bound that's saying that this is the the, the right quantity. Um, yeah. so, so currently, the lower bound in the archive version of the paper is stated uh, like 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 this. Um, like it's minimax by taking like some some cases, but it's trivial to replace this with DM. It's kind of still a bit unsatisfactory because we have uh you know the mark of assumption we observe states what yes not. i agree yet, mm -hmm. yet we are saying that well we do all this computation if we are lucky then we have these bonds but we don't know whether we have them yes we don't have any certification yes uh, yes I, I i completely agree and and the, the ideal that. bond like needs to be more fine-grained that actually depends on uh, every individual pi and the importance weights and 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 potentially so, so that that will be on the future work, but at the moment we're trying to establish the right rate. Sure, sure, yeah, yeah, like uh, some baselines yes. to start from. Um, okay, so that's okay. like I guess I'm already like out of time for the main thing. Um, so I I mean to highlight some key technical components from the proof and state of view open problems. So so maybe for the interest of the general audience, so let me directly jump to the open problem, and I'll save the technical discussion to the next uh, 30 minutes. All right. Um, OK, so let's see how we can do it. OK. 
Okay, there we go. Um, okay, um, I, I guess, um, uh, well, um, so so one of the open pro pro problem is that is the rate, uh, like notice that we've proven some sort of a local uniform convergence within say a constant window of the empirical optimal policy. So it is actually still unknown um, whether the same bond holds for the global uniform convergence. And the kind of uh, lower bound that we construct is by a, a reduction to uh, to online RL and the reduction to to actually embedding a bunch of bandits. Um, like like that doesn't necessarily say anything about the uniform convergence of those suboptimal policies. Okay, so it is unclear whether you can achieve the same bound for the global uniform convergence. And the second thing that's related and more open-ended is is what is the natural complexity measure uh, for our RL policy class, right? So so um, so whenever you see say um, the the kind of contextual bandits work with uh, the square root of log. Uh, policy class, um, then that translates into HS. If you do a direct reduction through that, you, you end up getting suboptimal dependency in H. So are there anything like special about RL that, that leads to the, the kind of natural complexity measure that characterizes this sample complexity? Uh, so so the, at least uh, like I wanted this to be satisfactory such that it recovers the kind of result that we get where this dimension depends on outer H. Okay, there are a couple of other low-hanging fruits and some of these like means working on it. I won't bore you with it and the slides are all shared and feel free to work on any of these problems and then uh, alert me. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, with that, I'm happy to take questions. Really awesome, thank you. Thanks. Yes, very nice. Yeah. So I don't know if anybody has any specific questions, or maybe we should like look at the proofs. Well, I do I'm have. Uh, I don't know whether we should we should start with high level questions or look at the proofs. So there, there was one side discussion that was going on with Lynn about uh, some results uh, can't be translated back from the discounted setting because this final horizon <laughs> setting is. Like also this no stationarity comes in in two ways that the transition kernels are all different and the rewards are all different. And if they were the same, then even in that case, the policies uh, would mm -hmm. depend on the, whole, on, on the number of stages left in the episode. Um, and uh, I was thinking about that. Okay, a related question to that is that I guess for convenience, it's it's nice to look at a case when you have these transition kernels not shared between the stages and the rewards not shared between the stages. But if they were, then a clever algorithm would exploit that, but the, then maybe there are certain dependencies that are not so nice and easy to handle. And then like, have you have you thought about this problem? Like, yes. <laughs> do, they, do there exist versions of these results for the shared yes. case, which in my opinion is, is somewhat more interesting? Yes, yes. I mean, like, um, this is also super interesting, but the shared case is, I think. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, talk, um, talk about that. That's an that's an excellent question, and and it's really sharp um, that for you to point out that that the the time varying nature of the problem setup is actually um, some somehow simplifying um, that helps us to get the nice conditional independence, and so everything you can view all the um, trajectories that's being collected by mu uh, as as some sort of a, a filtration uh, over the, the the course of h. Right, so that allows us to 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 construct some sort of a, a martingale decomposition over H, and then like apply concentration and so on. Um, so so me me has some um, like a related work on on this that deals with the shared parameter setting, um, and also deal with the infinite horizon setting. Um, but but that applies only to specific algorithm to uh, the offline learning problem, but not the uniform convergence. So. Mm -hmm. uh, um, like to to handle those cases, like some more technical uh, uh, details to to take care of the um, conditional independences rather than marginal independences are needed. But but I'd say that if you condition on uh, um, like the number of the observations for every state, um, um, and uh, um, and then like you can 
like more or less reduce it to the generative model setting. Um, so, so like I'm just waving my hand when saying that. Um, it's more complicated than that, but but on the high, high level, that's that's the way to go. Mm. Yeah. So, so the key difference from the generative model setting is really that now these transitions are 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 depending on each other. So, so they're not completely independent. So, taking care of that would result in um, some part of our main result. And, and yeah, you should hope to reduce sample complexity by exploiting that structure is shared between the stages. We have large number of structure, yes. large number of stages. Yes. Um, you you, right. Yes. Um, so it's. Yeah. Okay. So what's the state of the art for that problem? Oh, oh, yes. Yeah. So, uh, the state of the art for that problem is that in offline learning, um, you can get the, the, the optimal sample complexity um, by simply dropping um, another H. Um, okay. um, and, and, and for uniform convergence, there's no work around. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, except for the simulation, uh, simulation lemma. Yeah. Okay. Um, there's a question from uh, uh, Shipra um, on, can you give more intuition about DM? I'm looking for some general discussion uh, about how it relates to the structure of MDP and policy. And is this necessarily a good characterization to use? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so DM is assumed to be something that's coming from a combination of the MDP that's given and the login policy. Um, whenever you specify these two, there's a DM that's given, um, but uh, there's no guarantee that the DM is non-negative, uh, like uh, is po strictly positive, um, uh, or it's rate. Like suppose you are having like a uniformly mixing MDP kind of assumption, then DM is essentially one over SA, um, and and in in the cases where uh, I, I guess you have a covering, um, like a covering lens kind of assumption, you can also like uh, talk about DM and relate that to other other assumptions. Um, like it's not really a, an assumption that I like, it's exactly the least um, likable thing about this work. Um, so, so, so we're working on like coming up with more like a uh, um, data dependent bond that essentially give you something like this that you have a different bond for, for different pi uh, with the same policy. So this is ongoing work. Yeah, so related to that is that one would expect that if the behavior policy was not visiting parts of the states that are by and large irrelevant and can be proven yes. to be irrelevant without going there, going into that those parts, then they sh it shouldn't matter and the bonds and the results should, e should express this, right? Yes, yes, I, I I I agree. So so you can go with a more like agnostic kind of assumption by saying that well, instead of uh, trying to find the optimal policy, let's try to let's try to find the optimal policy where uh, oh, yeah. within the set of uh, states and actions where this uh, right. meal can actually explore. I didn't actually mean that because there is something in between to make the results even more instance dependent, uh -huh. right? Yeah, yeah. You could um, do that. But right. what, what you're saying is also true. Uh, yeah, so so the kind of bond that we wanted to get is the soup, and then there's the reweighting function, um, some kind of a rate that depends on, um, so maybe multiply by square root of n, and then some constant parameter depending on pi uh, mu, um, I guess HSA, and so on, and maybe just all the other pr properties of this MDP. Um, and then um, you are bounding this um, uh, estimated value um, to be smaller than, than some kind of constant. Th that would be a stronger uniform convergence bound that's more data dependent. And then for every pi that's out there, if you are, the pi is here, then you get a larger bound. If the pi is here, then you get a smaller bound. So that should look something that's very much similar to the point-wise convergence bound, which depends on Kramer rollover bound. Um, we already have that, but with, with a blow up of uh, um, S through the through the union bond argument. Yeah. Cool. Um, uh, Tom have another question in the chat. Can you say something about on the sample complexity in both evaluation and optimization phase? 
um, the current sample complexity upper bound is tight. Uh, is the current bound tight in the sense that the smaller number of samples cannot ensure good performance? Um, yes and yes. Um, so the sample complexity bound that we got uh, are optimal in off offline evaluation and learning, uh, but that optimality is in the minimax sense. Okay, so so yeah, I, we we don't have a like instance specific lower bound or upper bound uh, for the learning pro uh, for, the, for the optimization problem. Great. So, are there any questions from the YouTube uh, part of it? Um, yeah, I can't really see it. Okay, okay, great. So maybe we should get back to the technical parts of it. Uh, yeah. Um, actually, Kishan had a question earlier, and I said that like, oh, okay. I yeah. So I, I just read that question. Theorem four point five in the paper gives the minimum value of the algorithm policy. Can that actually be made as close as in the online case? Uh, I, I guess, yeah. He's wondering about the gap between, of, sorry, offline and online, and like this characterization. I guess maybe this picture somewhat answers that. Um, so what would you say? Like uh, you're in the offline case, can you compete with an online algorithm in terms of sample complexity? Oh, yeah. Yeah, if um, if the login policy is sufficiently uh, exploratory, say say if DM is actually proportional to one over SA, then then yes. Otherwise, no. Otherwise, it depends on DM. And yeah, I mean, that's that's already quite nice, right? Like because it could have also have happened that even in that case, uh, yeah. somehow you are prevented from doing this. It's not entirely trivial. Yeah, I guess. So, so I, uh, I suppose we can move on, and like I'm curious to to see some details. All right, so um, let's uh, let's go there. Uh, I have a couple of slides prepared um, to talk about the key components from the proof. Okay. Um, yeah. I figure this part is going to be the more interesting part for you guys, but the, I wanted to make sure that the message is clear first. Um, so, so the first technique that I'm going to be talking about is so-called fictitious estimator technique that in some sense, uh, um, yeah, there's another question. I don't think I understand how the link between offline and OPE is made. Maybe it's, oh, uh, so O in the OPE stands for offline. So I'm not talking about online off policy evaluation at all in today's talk. I'm, Dealing with an offline setting altogether. Um, is that clarifying, Matthias? All right. Um, so, so the, the fictitious estimator technique is saying that, well, uh, uh, let's create something that's fictitious you cannot actually run, and, and so that um, if it is um, under the um, if it is under the, the nice event where every state and action is observed like more than the number of times as permitted by the logging policy, right, by a factor of one uh, half, then uh, this estimator is identical to, um, to, to the empirical plugging estimator. Like, otherwise, you all put the, the real thing, the, the ground truth. So when, when this nice event condition is not true, you simply Putting the, the plugging the, the the right quantity, the the conditional expectation and the actual transition. If this condition is true, then you then you're plugging your empirical estimate. Okay, so so the idea is that well now we can change this estimator together to construct an estimator for this uh, state action visitation and for the um, um, and and also for the. Uh, um, estimated reward and use it to construct a plugin estimator that's fictitious uh, for any policy pi. So what's the advantage of that relative to, to directly working with the uh, the, the plugin estimator? So so first of all, like this n can be zero with non-zero probability. 
right? So, so, so you have to somehow deal with it somehow. This is just saying that you need something that's stronger to get um, to, 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 to the better rate. So, so the fictitious estimator allows us to uh, show that whenever you are working with this, it's always unbiased. Um, so you only have to worry about the variance. So there's a like a empirical version of the Bellman equation of variance here that decomposes over the number of uh, um, trajectories. Okay, uh, there's also a nice martingale decomposition of this uh, that, that allows you to, the uh, martingale decomposition of this and also the corresponding error that, that allows you to, to apply concentration. Um, and, and, the, the, and the best part of it is, is that, uh, um, the best part of it is that, is that with high probability, it is actually identical to um, the, the actual um, estimator. Yeah, so, so, you, so you basically get all this unbiasedness, all these uh, nice properties for free. Okay, with, with some mild assumption on, on, and larger than, than one over dm. Uh, well, uh, so um, the, I, I guess the second step is to say directly analyze this quantity. So, so you, can, you can decompose it by uh, adding and, uh, and by, by adding and removing um, like a, this quantity so that you can group them into, into two parts and then um, bond each part separately. Um, so, um, so, so, so first of all, um, uh, it is straightforward to deal with the second case, but because no, notice that like the, the right-hand side of this uh, error term like is independent to pi. So can, you can essentially uh, obtain the L infinity bond here with high probability and, and notice that this one has bonded L1 norm being one, since this is a probability. Uh, therefore, you can, it's straightforward to calculate the second part actually have um, the same error rate as, as a point-wise convergence. So, so I, I guess you, you've seen this um, like a, a lot of times before already, because this is essentially saying that it suffices to consider the case with deterministic reward. So, so this deals with the reward randomness. And, and the second thing is um, like um, 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 kind of marketing guild decomposition of this uh, fictitious estimator versus the corresponding ground truth. So, so by just plugging uh, the definition of this, you can come up with a primal representation of the difference of this form. Um, and with some algebra that applies the definition of D tilde and by recursively applying Bellman equations uh, here and there, and then you can get this dual representation um, and, and, and also this marching guild decomposition of this error. Okay, so 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 um, so this is the corresponding error from the estimator of the first step, estimating this d tilde, um, matching the state distribution of um, uh, step one, and and the second term. So so this is the estimate of your transition kernel. Sorry, I'm using an inconsistent notation. So read this as as a p uh, t, but this is p t from s a to uh, probability distribution supported on on the s space. Um, uh, well, um, and, and even though I have this here, I, it means that, that this is a vector in R to the S, and R to the S, and after you multiply these two matrices, and so this is R to the S A, and this is R S times S A, so you end up getting something that that's, uh, uh, matches what you expect, okay? So, so with this marching code decomposition, there are two implications of that. The first is that um, you, can, uh, you can use it um, like with some additional effort to derive the point-wise con uh, convergence with high probability. Um, so, so, so you needed to use a special kind of Friedman's inequality that allows you to use, like usually the Friedman's inequality requires abundantness of individual components with, with probability one. Right, so you, so you need to use a special kind of it that might be convenient in the other context as well from Chong and Lu that allows you to deal with a high probability bond um, of um, um, and, and essentially condition on that. So so there's a Friedman's inequality that allows you to do that, and by con co combining that with some um, like uh, fine grained variance calculation from our um, like. Um, Point-wise OPE paper uh, that AS yes, steps, then then you can you can basically get a high probability bond here. 
And, and the idea to handle the uniform convergence, like we've tried a bunch of things, so this is one of them, um, is to apply this Martin Go decomposition and use the Redemacher's complexity style argument. So, so I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it in details. So, so usually, like for, for those who are familiar with the Redemacher complexity uh, argument, it's essentially saying that you treat this soup thing as a random variable, and you are first establishing the concentration of this to its expectation. Right, so this this is usually done by the micro DR made inequality, and 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 it takes a, us a little bit of effort to to construct the kind of a specific perturbation that satisfy all the necessary uh, um, um, like quantities in order to get rid of that factor of s on top. But but with that, you can you can get show that the perturbation um, um, term is op optimal up to a suboptimality factor of square root of h. Okay, um, and it remains to bond um, this expected value, which turns out to be the more 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 challenging part. Um, so, well, um, so um, to bond the expectation, um, so we can again apply the marketing code decomposition to um, put this here. Um, we can apply the marketing code decomposition and then move the supremum inside by, by, by putting this H outside. So by doing this, we're already losing on a factor of H dependence uh, in, the, in the square root. Um, but, but let's not worry about that and then see uh, how we can, we can take care of the, these, these two terms. So, so um, this term is trivial. It corresponds to only the first, uh, first step. And, and the challenge is actually in, the, uh, in, in, bonding, in, in, bonding, in bonding the other term. So, um, Right, so so um, uh, well, um, the the idea is that um, like like this is a slightly stronger result as we have stated in the in the paper, um, but but like we knock out the factor of uh, dependence on s here, but this is still suboptimal because you don't actually depend on s here. But through a Redmacher complexity argument for uh, the kind of linear function classes uh, with bounded norm um, and with some care to be taken for for, for these. Um, the hat that that you 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 can end up uh, getting um, this bond on this uh, on this expectation term. Um, so 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 let me highlight the key challenge. Um, so 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 the key challenge here is is that notice that you have this inner product where you want to take the soup over pi, but both terms actually depends on pi, right? So so this term depends on pi. This term also depends on pi, um, and and by uh, moving this to the other side, uh, like in, in the in the pointwise convergence case, you can move this to the other side and combine this and that. Um, and since pi is fixed, um, then you can more easily deal with that um, and and then knock out a factor of s. Um, but but when pi is chosen uh, in a data dependent way, you can't actually do that. Um, so, so so the key challenge is to group the things into. Um, a inner product of two things that one depends only on the policy, the other depends only on the data. Um, so, so it's challenging to do that due to the multi-linear structure of the um, uh, of 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 the uh, the, the Markov decision process. Um, <clears throat> so, um, yeah, we'll, we'll see how to get around that with with local um, um, uniform convergence. But for the global uniform convergence, the the idea is that. Uh, you can essentially somehow choose this pi such that you find the sign of this this v v h pi um, like from its expectation that that somehow corresponding to the same sign of whether this error turns out to be positive or negative. So so I don't know whether this um, like so that that's one of the reasons that I I'm not too sure whether the global uniform convergence is something that you can get without. Uh, um, like blowing up another factor of either H or S, um, but yeah. So, so th those are not not concrete, concretely proven. Um, what, what we have is this is suboptimal by a factor of H and S. Yeah. So by by just combining these two and everything we talked about so far, we have proven the uniform convergence theorem um, for the for the global um, um, policy class and also for the for the family of deterministic policy class. All right, and, um, and and before I go to the local uniform convergence, are there any parts of the discussion so far that's um, okay? Um, so so the idea before behind the local uniform convergence result is uh, uh, is to to somehow connect this to the generative model approach uh, 
specifically through um, the, the technique of uh, Arkawa Kakade and Yang, uh, code 20. So is, is Lin still here? Um, um, yeah, so this is an excellent paper if you haven't read it. Um, so, so maybe it's a good idea to read it. Um, so so uh, recall that in Bellman equation, for every policy pi, you have this um, decomposition of the Q function uh, that allows you to do the, to the, to do the backups. Um, and you can also state the same for the empirical um, estimated MDP by replacing every Q and, and P and R with a corresponding hat version of them. Since it's a valid MDP, it also satisfies the same Bellman equation. And the idea from AKY uh, is to, well, take the difference of the two, right? So once you take the difference of the two and, and, and um, there's a, a interesting relationships and you can reorganize this term uh, into, uh, by decomposing into, in, into um, some quantity multiplied with an error term, okay? And if you back up this like error equation from last step all the way to, to, to step T, um, like you end up getting like this uh, equation with this like new new gamma matrix in the middle to be simply the multi-step transition matrix of the dimension S A by S A. Okay, and and um, so uh, so with that. Um, um, with that, you can try to bond um, the absolute value point-wise for every element of this matrix uh, Q hat uh, pi hat minus uh, QT pi pi hat, where, where pi hat is any policy that you choose in the data-dependent fashion. Um, so, so by doing that, you can further decompose the error into two terms, and with absolute value, you can bond the two terms separately. Um, and, and, and let me give you the intuition. And the, the second term, in the second term, um, you, uh, you no notice that it depends on this V hat pi, pi hat star. So this is empirically uh, a, a near optimal policy. Uh, and, and this is what you find. So, so the, the, that, that's what the, gives rise to this epsilon opt term here. And, and everything else, you can do some crude calculation and end up getting uh, this term. So notice that there's p hat minus ph, so therefore you have this right one over ndm scaling here. So, so if you choose uh, epsilon opt to be something small, then you can make this uh, matching the, 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 the optimal rate that we expect. So it remains to deal with the first term. Um, so, 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 so here's a key observation. That's, that's really the key that allows us to tighten the dependence on H and S. Um, so, so the idea is that uh, now that we are able to replace this pi hat with pi hat star, and pi hat star is something that's completely um, depending only on the future data, like in terms of every episode, now you are at time T, the choice, the decision of pi hat conditioned on the current state have something to do with only the future. So with that, that decouples this product of p hat ph with v hat pi. So notice that that's a troublesome part um, that we run into when, when trying to apply the Rademacher complexity type of argument, because you can essentially choose the kind of imperious policy such that the product of these two like have the same sign so that they don't really cancel out with each other, right? So, so, so this is a key underlying insight that allows you to save a factor of s. Um, and, and then like um, it's the, the tedious calculation that, that you, you, you basically have this expression and then you can apply this expression. Um, like uh, you first bound this expression, it happens that it depends on also on the summation of the, the same differences, um, like when you sum all the way to the last, last step. Um, but, but luckily the saving grace is that you have this factor of one over dm here. So, so this will end up becoming some kind of lower order term. Um, well, um, and with this formula, you can recursively apply um, the backups from the last step all the way to t equals to one, uh, and and then using the same kind of tight variance calculation um, from like the the lemma um, uh, three point four um, from the uh, uh, Yin and Wang um, uh, twenty twenty AI stats. Um, this is a paper that we uh, deal with a pointwise convergence where we calculate the sum of uh, H, potentially H squared terms that end up getting 
uh, h square. Um, so, 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 so by, by applying a conditional version of that, you can save another factor of h. Okay, so, so finally, so, so I, I, I wanted to note that we made some um, improvement in terms of the parameters comparing to uh, the AK, uh, AKY work uh, in the setting of the um, like local uniform convergence in terms of dependence on epsilon opt. Um, so, so when we compare the local uniform convergence, so the corresponding lemma is AKY lemma 10. So they require the, the planning um, algorithm and the search algorithm to obtain an, an optimal policy that are extremely close to the empirically optimal policy with this quantity. Whereas we have shown that within a much, much larger window, at least in the cases when S is not um, like that large, um, in a much larger window, you can, you can end up uh, uh, getting um, um, like the same like optimal rate for the uniform convergence. And, and if we just apply these local uniform convergence results to the offline learning problem, um, you, can, you can see that uh, the theorem one, so this is the main result of AKY, they obtain this optimal rate plus this computational term that have an additional factor of H in front of epsilon R, whereas we, we, we managed to knock it off with this additional uh, condition that epsilon R is small. Okay, so that, that's, um, um, I guess that's, that's, that's all I have. Um, yeah, I hope that's just clarifying of some of the technical parts of it. Um, now, no, I hope it was awesome, yeah. yeah, I think now let, let me answer uh, Matthew's question because that question has been on there for, for more than 10 minutes. I meant the connection between OPN and OPL. I think a link can be made Oh, oh yeah. So, so, so OPE uh, is solves the problem of estimating, um, like find um, v hat pi for a fixed pi, right? So, and and then you want to minimize, uh, uh, say, uh, say with high probability. So, so this is the task of P. You are given a policy that's not chosen according to the data. On the other hand, like in, in OPIL, in all policy learning, so, so this pi depends on the data. Uh, uh, so, so you need to evaluate, um, say, pi hat as a function of the data against its um, actual value. So you want to show that this one is epsilon. So the second problem is a much harder problem. And one way to approach this is through the so-called uniform convergence algorithm. So, so, so if you can show that with high probability, the soup over all pi uh, in some policy set, where this policy set, uh, where, where pi hat is inside this policy, policy class, um, then uh, you, you, can, you can argue that since um, this statistical convergence apply uniformly to all these uh, hypotheses at the same time. Um, like usually it's achieved through some uh, union bond or empirical process theory argument um, that allows you to obtain the the the, the uh, off policy learning problem. Um, like like it's stronger, so you don't necessarily need this in order to get the optimal rate for the off policy learning. But there are good properties about the uniform convergence that you want to rely on that 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 makes it uh, appealing uh, an appealing topic to to consider. Yeah. 